Yep. Um, yeah, it's good to be here. Uh, I was here in uh, uh, 2010, I think, for the last time. So it's it's great to be back. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about uh, the history uh, his or a history of massive galaxies, not necessarily the history of massive galaxies. I don't think we're we're quite quite there yet, uh, but it's. Um, I think we're getting closer in, in really understanding how uh, the most massive galaxies in the universe, like you know this this massive elliptical galaxy here, uh, were formed. The um, the talk actually follows mostly a single paper um, that came out this year uh, up there, um, and it just came out in in EPJ. Now, um, so th that paper is is here. Okay, this is the paper, and uh, you know if listening to a single paper for an hour is it sounds like a bad bad thing. It could be worse. You could be reading it uh, <laughs> because it's actually uh, 38 pages and 255 figure panels. <laughs> and so I, I, I won't have 255 uh, slides, I, I promise. Um, but anyway, uh, so this paper kind of got out of hand. And uh, so, will, so will this talk because it will follow this paper. Um, and uh, the initial part is, is really about what, what seems to be somewhat of a detail in a way, like the properties of one particular class of galaxy. Uh, but then when we, we get to the end, uh, it actually turns into something that's broader and has implications for, for galaxy evolution in general. Uh, and we're trying to get some sort of picture of, of how galaxies sort of evolve, both in their mass and in their size uh, through cosmic time. Okay, so uh, we start in, in 2005. Uh, ten years ago, um, with a uh, with a discovery, uh, Manu Dadi and, and others had found in the ultra deep fields this this image taken by Hubble, uh, you know, of a small part of the sky. They found this these remarkable galaxies, um, you know, like like this one. This is actually a later image that that we took with a new camera, uh, but this object was found by 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 Dadi, um, and uh, they they're, they're galaxies that are very massive. So this one is about the mass of the Milky Way, actually, um, but but tiny. So the half-light radius is 400 parsecs of this object. Okay, so we're eight kiloparsecs from the center of the Milky Way. Uh, you know, but here you have half the mass of this galaxy is, is is in less than half a kiloparsec, and it's actually more or less unresolved here. The, 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 this is a diffraction ring and diffraction spikes of Hubble, so it looks like a star. You know, if you didn't know any better, but it's a galaxy, and you know, it's a massive galaxy, it's the mass of the Milky Way. Uh, the other thing is, it's at redshift two, so fairly early in the history of the universe. Uh, it's also dead. It's not forming stars. So it formed all its stars earlier. And um, so these things are remarkable. Now, th this is th the one good example in the ultra deep field because it's a tiny part of the sky. Uh, there were other galaxies that were a little bit less massive or a little bigger. Um, but it was at that time not quite clear how, um, how common this was. Uh, but subsequent studies, and, and this was our own effort in 2008, uh, confirmed that this is the norm for uh, dead galaxies at redshift 2. So if, if, you're, if, you're, if you stop forming stars and you live at redshift 2, uh, you're very small. You're, you're very compact. You have a high mass and, and a small size. So this is a plot that you'll see a lot of, of size on this axis, the effective radius here, half-light radius, half the mass within that radius, uh, versus stellar mass okay, here. Um, and uh, this is where sort of normal galaxies live in the Sloan survey. Uh, and here are these, these uh, quiescent galaxies uh, at redshift 2. Um, this is from a survey with the Gemini telescope and, and Hubble, and we also had some adaptive optics imaging with Keck thrown in in this paper. Um, and uh, you know, for a fixed mass of 10 to 11 solar masses here, very massive, uh, they're they're small. They're about one kiloparsec in size. So that's sort of the the number to keep in your head: 10 to 11 solar masses and stars, uh, one kiloparsec in, in size. And those things essentially don't exist in the in the nearby universe. Um, so that was confirmed in, in 2008. Um, and um, now uh, there, there's, there's one thing, um, you know, that's that was sort of the immediate implication of these things uh, is that their kinematics must be kind of unusual. Uh, because if you're that small and that massive, uh, you get very high velocities of the star. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we realized back then that this would be a good test of whether these things are actually real, whether inter we're interpreting the data correctly you know, whether they actually are this compact and this massive um, by, by measuring kinematics. So these are, these, these are the implied velocity dispersions of these galaxies, okay? Uh, and they, they're between 300 and 500 kilometers per second, okay? Uh, which is similar to the centers of giant ellipticals today and, and higher, okay? Because the, the 500 kilometers per second is not something you really see in the, in the local universe. 
Um, now, at that point, that was just an implication. Uh, we set out to measure this, uh, so that happened a year later, uh, more or less. Uh, it was kind of an uncertain measurement. It's very hard. Uh, this was in, in 29 hours with, with Gemini to try and measure a velocity dispersion in one of those eight galaxies, uh, the brightest one. And, uh, you know, it kind of worked. Here's the probability distribution uh, just using, you know, uh, Poisson errors. So uh, this is sort of the most optimistic case. Um, and uh, what we found was a velocity dispersion of 500 kilometers per second, uh, which was exactly actually uh, what was predicted based on the, the stellar mass and the size of this galaxy. So this was in 2009, a single object that we published in Nature. Um, and um, then, you know, now we're in 2015, and uh, we, we've, we've done better, uh, but it's, it's hard. It's still hard. Telescopes haven't gone bigger over that uh, decade. Uh, and so uh, this, this remains a really difficult measurement. Uh, so now we have about uh, eight uh, dispersions beyond the redshift of two. Uh, so these are absorption line kinematics of galaxies that are not forming stars, um, quiescent galaxies at, at redshift two. And uh, this is from a range of studies, and, and this is really, this is a huge amount of cat time mostly uh, that went into, it, into this. Uh, it's incredibly difficult. Um, but here on the vertical axis is the um, observed dispersion, so the actual measured dispersion, velocity, velocity dispersion. And this is the expected dispersion based on the masses and the sizes, right? Uh, and, and, you know, the galaxy I just showed is one of these points. Uh, and they all, you know, there's a nice correlation. You can derive a dynamical mass, of course, uh, versus stellar mass, just a projection of the same plot. Um, uh, yes, yeah, solid line is expected equal observed. So they're a little bit above, which could be due to dark matter or IMF or you know whatever you want. Uh, but they're on the on the right side of that line. Uh, this is for Chabrier IMF. So with, with cell Peter, they would actually like like it would be yeah well yeah uh, it would be slightly above yeah. Um, the, yeah, they're, they're actually a few are kind of flattened, which is interesting in itself. Um, and yeah, there's a lot to be said about that too. Um, we don't quite know what they are. I think they're disks, uh, thick disks, but who knows. Um, anyway, so, uh, and here's, um, here's one recent example that just came out like a month ago. Um, so lensing helps, of course. And so there's finally a, a lens galaxy. People have been looking for this also for like a decade. Uh, there's a few examples now. This is the brightest one uh, that was published by Drew Newman. And even this lens galaxy took like eight hours with Keck to get a velocity dispersion. Uh, so it's, it's, again, it's hard. Um, but, uh, but, you know, the, these, these dispersions really confirm that these things are compact and massive. Uh, yeah. Yeah, black is observed and blue is the best-fitting uh, best model. So, you know, the galaxy has strong Balmer lines. It's young which makes the dispersion measurement that, mo that much more difficult. Um, uh, this is the bomber break, actually. So it's, these are all bomber lines. No, it's, it's in there somewhere. Uh, but it's, it's dominated by the, the bomber break. Yeah. Relatively old. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, 0.8 giga year or something like that. Yeah. Um, all right, so um, so that's nice. So uh, w you know these studies uh, with a lot of hard work confirmed that these comp that these things are really compact and massive. And then the question is, what happens to them afterwards? Um, this is also a big field of study, and a lot of people have worried about this over the past uh, decade, and uh, you know, in including uh, Jerry and and uh, Thorsten Nab and, and that group. Um, and so the idea is that uh, there's there's consensus on this now, and it's sort of a topic of a whole different uh, colloquium. But the idea is that these things uh, are now in the cores of, of, of massive ellipticals. So they, they, they accrete their outer envelopes over time, uh, partly due to star formation, perhaps, mostly probably due to mer mergers. So minor mergers that uh, build up the wings of these galaxies and create these r to the one quarter law profiles today. And so there's a lot of studies. This is just a sort of a subset of them. Uh, but the, that's, that's now the, the general view that this, this is what's happening. And again, I can say more about that if people ask uh, later. So fine, so okay, great. We've, we've seen these cores at redshift two, and then you know, we think we understand how they evolve through redshift, uh, redshift zero. Huh. Hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I wrote a paper on this last year, actually, on the, on the cores themselves. And um, you actually, you, you do have a little bit of math loss uh, because of the old stars, you know, the, the, the AGB stars uh, shedding their outer envelopes and things. So you have, you have winds and, and math loss. And um, what happens is uh, there's, there's that mass loss, but then there's also adiabatic expansion because of that. And so if you do the numbers and, and count the number of cores above a certain mass limit, uh, it's consistent with, with being constant. So yeah. Yeah, the, the thought is that it gets swept up by the, by the ISM. So these things move, uh, typically, you know, are in, in moving clusters and rich environments, but it's unknown. If the mass is retained, uh, then you know the question is why is it not forming stars? It has to do with feedback and, and what AGNs do to galaxies, and it's a difficult topic of its own. Uh, but uh, but yeah, the, the number of, of, of these dense cores at redshift two is about the same as at redshift zero, with a small correction uh, due to um, due to mass loss. As far you know, the, the uncertainties in these stellar mass measurements are at the level of the mass loss, expected mass loss, sort of 0.1 depth. So it's it's hard to get this get this exactly right. Uh, but anyway, again, that's sort of a, a different different topic uh, than, than this talk. But thanks for the for the question. Um, so then, uh, for for this talk, we're actually turning to the question: How do these compact, uh, dense things form? Where do they come from? Right, these these dead things. And um, you know, there's been a bunch of proposed scenarios. Uh, one is merging. Uh, so you merge two galaxies together. Uh, two gas-rich galaxies, the gas uh, goes to the center, you have a big starburst that in, the, in the very center that will make a galaxy more compact. And then you have this star-forming uh, compact thing for a while and then, and then a dead thing. Uh, another is in-situ growth, uh, where you just have something that's already small and dense and then it gets a little bit more massive and, a, and, a, and it grows a little bit in size perhaps and then you get, get one of these things, um, sort of the most boring path. Uh, and then compaction, this is very popular at the moment. Uh, Avishai Dekel and others have been promoting this, this particular model uh, where you have uh, a gas-rich disk that's unstable and uh, you, know, you have violent disk instabilities, uh, you have clumps that, that, that move inside that, that you know, somehow lose angular momentum, you get to the center, form a lot of stars, and you get a compact galaxy. Uh, the physics is not quite clear of how this process works, but, but that's, the, uh, that's the idea. Um, and so there's these three sort of toy models. Now all of these models have one thing in common. You get this intermediate phase of a compact, you know, star forming thing before you get a compact dead thing. So we first start by looking for those things. You know, do we, do we see those compact star forming galaxies at high redshift? Um, and uh, this has been done, uh, Guillermo Barrow actually uh, was, well, there, there's a bunch of studies, but I think his are the most, uh, you know, uh, the, the most impactful uh, using the candles uh, data set he's a student of uh, or a postdoc of uh, Sandy Faber and uh, they uh, they published a few papers uh, identifying compact star forming galaxies at redshift 2 uh, and so uh, he was kind of the first uh, we've uh, done a similar thing using this 3D HST survey which is a bigger bigger survey and we have uh, redshifts and things uh, but in essence uh, you know if you read on this topic i would recommend those those papers as well Uh, not really. Yeah, it's uh, what is discriminant. Yeah, I'll, I'll 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 get to something that might be discriminant. But the timescales are very uncertain. They all kind of have like between 100 million and 500 million years for the star forming phase, which is also what we see at those at those stars. Um, uh, so anyway, we use this 3D HST survey and a brief you know shout out to that because it was a big project. Um, so this was a, a GRISM survey with the Hubble Space Telescope. So we used uh, Hubble as a spectrograph, uh, putting in a grism in the beam instead of a uh, filter, and uh, we, we that, that gives you spectra. And so we took spectra of like 250,000 galaxies over these well-studied extragalactic fields, um, and um, fit them and, and got redshifts, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And it's all released now. So we had a big meeting uh, a few weeks ago to sort of celebrate the release, and so the paper's out and all the data are available, uh, which is really nice. Uh, quarter pedigree, roughly. Huge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's it basically is the same as the candles footprint. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so, uh, and just to illustrate what we have, these are the these are um, twenty thousand spectra of the survey, 
um, stacked, you know, on top of each other, um, going, you know, going up in redshift here. So this is redshift over half, and this is the rest frame wavelength that we're measuring. Um, so these are uh, titanium oxide absorption features here, and then as we go to higher redshift and more spectra, you get H alpha, redshift 0.7, and sulfur 2, and then here you get oxygen 3 and H beta, and then oxygen 2 and the bomber dust uh, are to redshift 2. And so there's no redshift desert anymore. You know, that's, that's gone uh, with Hubble, uh, which is great. Um, and so all this is available, uh, and uh, you know it, it really is a game changer in, in, in these types of surveys, which is which is nice. Uh, this was everything actually. We well we also in the paper we show like you know emission line galaxies, absorption line galaxies, and all sorts of other things. But you can split the sample any which way. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. The, the, and actually, there's there's interesting things. If you go to fainter magnitudes. On the one hand, you have lower signal to noise. On the other hand, the emission lines get stronger. And so it turns out that we get good spectra down to like 25th, 26th magnitude, which we'd never expected. And so that's why we first we first extracted only spectra down to like H of 24, but now we do it down to H of 26 uh, because there's a lot of information at uh, the faint levels. Um, so then how, we sel how do we select the galaxies then from that survey? Um, so again, this is size versus mass, same plot as we've seen before. And then this is this region of sort of massive and compactness, right? Massive and, and small. Um, so this is what we define as being compact. Now, Guillermo Barrow had a more permissive selection. So a lot of his sample is a little bit lower mass and a little bit larger. But we're, we're really focusing on the most massive, most compact things in this study. And so you have these compact fluorescent galaxies, which are the red dots. So those were the objects I talked about before. But then as you can see, there's also a lot of blue dots. Okay? And those are star forming galaxies. So they exist. Uh, you know, most star-forming galaxies uh, at this redshift are larger, right? Um, but there are these small star-forming galaxies that are consistent with being progenitors of these 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 dead um, uh, compact things. And if you then look at the number density as a function of redshift, um, so this is all star-forming galaxies versus redshift here, uh, number density, and uh, the quiescent galaxies here they build up. Uh, you know, you have more at lower redshift, the, the fraction increases as a function of the total. Um, but then the, uh, these are the compact fluorescent galaxies, which actually have a peak. So there's an era where these galaxies are very common, these compact dead things, uh, which was seen before, but never as, as clearly, I think, as, as here, uh, that they really sort of rise and then peak and then go away again. And the idea is they go away because they merge, you know, they, they, they grow bigger. And so they, they get into this population. Um, but they arise probably because of these guys. This is the star-forming compact population here. And so they also peak, but they peak earlier than the, than the compact fluorescent ones. And so you have this, the idea is you have this constant influx of these star-forming compact things that then turn into these compact fluorescent things whose number density increases as a result. Uh, and then when these things go away, you no, no longer get new compact fluorescent ones. And so they merge away and, and that's the end of it. Uh, is, is, is the problem. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, the, the, um, the, the star from, well, uh, w there might be galaxies we can't see at all. Uh, you know, it's an age selected sample. So uh, th there could be galaxies, that, but it's not just things that are UV bright, no. Uh, it's, yeah. yeah, yeah, and so what you get is half a gig a year. Th they live about half a gig a year in this, in this, yeah. Half a gig. So <laughs> Which is what Barrow got to and, and drew com opposite conclusions as we do. So, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. A another way to say it is about half of the, uh, a third to a half of the stars in, in these galaxies was formed in that compact mode. Uh, so that's, an, that's a more productive way maybe of, of saying the same thing. Um, yes and no. Um, th there are... There are intrinsic things, uh, intrinsic uh, parts of the selection that throw out AGN. For instance, if they're highly variable, uh, we would have a flag in our photometry that throws them out. Uh, but we don't, this includes X-ray sources at this point. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to that. Oh, uh, yeah, 10 to the minus 6, uh, below the plot. Uh, yeah. Uh, they're, they're very rare. But a lot of, a lot of these st star-forming compact things do have AGN, uh, weak ones. But uh, So th they are building black holes at the same time as those stars. 
which is a complication slash interesting aspect of it. Um, yeah, most of them are. Yeah. Yeah, these are just, the, that's right. The, yeah, those are just the Poisson uncertainties. That's right. We, you know, that we, we, we might be missing some extremely obscured ones uh, that's, that are either undetected in the age bands or, or so obscured that they mess up the spectrometry. Um, but yeah, the, the, the typical obscuration of the H alpha line is a factor of 10 in our samples. Uh, we know that we have IR spectrometry for, you know, the, from Spitzer for, for all of them. Uh, so we have a sense of the obscure star formation rate, and it always exceeds uh, the UV star formation rate by about a factor of 30 or 200, and the H alpha star formation rate by a factor of 10 or so. So yeah. Um, no, uh, not yet. No, although it's hard to say sometimes. Yeah. And uh, you know, we, we were very concerned about uh, you know things just masquerading as compact galaxies that were actually AGM or dominated by the AGM as a point source. Um, but I can come back to that later if you, you know, want. Okay, so uh, what we did then was um, we got tech spectra for uh, 25 of these, well, 20 of our own. And then uh, again, Barrow had done, uh, had been here before and had published five that we included. So it's 25 total. Uh, and in the size mass diagram, these are the ones with, with spectra now. So it's K-band spectra to measure the H alpha line. And you know, one of the goals is to see whether these things, again, just like we did with the um, quiescent ones, to see whether they're actually compact and massive. And now the question is not whether we see uh, a, a broad absorption lines, because they're essentially invisible in these, these star-forming galaxies, uh, but whether we see a broad H alpha line, uh, you know, whether we see evidence for, uh, for high masses from, from the emission line kinematics. Um, and so these are images of the galaxies that we have spectra for. Uh, and so you know, it's sort of a mixed bag. Uh, most of them are sort of visibly compact. Others are not, like this one. Uh, and this just means it's very obscure. So in mass, it's actually, uh, you know, very would be very bright here. Uh, but in the light, it's actually kind of faint. And it has a size of about a particular parsec. Uh, it's just that it has a, a mass of several times 10 to the 11. So that's why it falls in the compact region. Uh, yeah, yeah, one, uh, this thing has a, has a, has a clear tidal field. Uh, again, uh, and uh, this thing is a merger of two compact galaxies, actually. So this will actually decrease the number of compact star-forming galaxies because they're both in that category. So that it's kind of a mixed bag. Now, and, and these are the uh, spectral energy distributions of them. So this is spectrometry, and uh, the red is a model uh, fit to each galaxy. So you get these, these, these Balmer breaks uh, or 4,000 angstrom breaks. Some galaxies are very dusty, like this one, very dust-obscured star-forming SED. Uh, others are quite blue, like this one here. So it's sort of a mixed bag. Now I've ordered these, uh, you know, by a particular property of the galaxies, and I wonder if anybody can guess what I ordered them by. Is there any, you know, do you see any, any trends here? These are images and SEDs. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> I, uh, th uh, nothing. But they're ordered by the velocity dispersion. Yeah. So here are the, the spectra, the, the H alpha and uh, N2. Uh, so this is H alpha, and here it's uh, N2. Uh, and uh, you know the velocity dispersions uh, span a, a kind of a crazy range, which is partly why we took a long time to write this paper, um, because we couldn't understand it. So the, the, the at the high at the high velocity dispersion end, you have these very complex uh, things with high N2 over H alpha ratios and, and generally complex kinematics. Uh, you know up to 500 or 700, yeah, kilometers per second. Oh, uh, the empty panels are the uh, the borrow objects. Uh, so the, uh, we didn't get their spectra, but we got their fit. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> might as well show the fit. Um, but then there's these things, right? 50 kilometers, 50 kilometers per second. And you know, mass goes as sigma squared, right? So uh, this is this is completely nuts, really, for these objects. Uh, not here, no. No, I'll get to that later. But uh, very good question. Um, but uh, yeah, 50, 50, 100, you know, and that, that's what we saw at the telescope even, like these, these incredibly low dispersions, uh, which really shouldn't occur for these galaxies. I mean, even if there's rotation, even if, you know, all those things, and we'll, we'll get through that. But uh, that's really remarkable, this large range. And it doesn't seem to correlate with anything. We couldn't at the telescope either, like, predict what we'd see based on the SED and the image that we had. 
Um, yeah, 300, 400. Yeah, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. Um, and there's one galaxy we, we did understand, this one. <laughs> so this one. And because uh, it has a, a, a dispersion of 350 and two of H alpha ratio, that's kind of normal. So, you know, star formation. It had no AGN. It, it just and it was very compact. And so we probably said in nature last year. So it was in one out of the 25 that we understood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Typical case. There we go. Uh, and then we wrote a 40 page paper to understand the rest. Um, Anyway, so uh, this is then the same plot again, for, uh, observed dispersion versus expected dispersion, and these are the absorption line kinematics of the quiescent ones that we just saw, and here are the uh, star forming galaxies. Um, so they, they don't play ball, you know, they're all over the place, uh, and so including, yeah, these, these things. Uh, now the predicted dispersion of these are like 200, not uh, 400 as it happens, uh, but the, you know, these are 300 and measured as 100, and this is then the dynamical mass versus stellar mass, and you get you know apparent dynamical masses of below 10 to the 10, uh, whereas they all should be around 10 to the 11. Uh, so problematic. And so the implication is that the, 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 the gas in these compact star forming galaxies does not trace the stars in the compact quiescent galaxies, if they're related at all, but that's what we're still uh, assuming here. Well, we'll get to that. Thank you for giving away the punchline. Uh, <laughs> uh, so um, now the first thing you can wonder is, is it, is it inclination? I was just looking at phase on disk, you know, and, and uh, edge on galaxies. Is that what causes the large spread? And uh, it, that's partially actually true, uh, which is nice in itself to see. So this is the observed gas dispersion here versus the uh, excess ratio of the galaxy. And there is a correlation, you know, it's not a very, uh, very strong one, but it's uh, there. There is a significant correlation, and it's in the direction that you'd expect. So, if rotation is dominant in these things, you'd expect the more phase on ones to have lower dispersion, and it actually gives a constraint on winds because in M82 like winds, you'd expect the opposite trend. That if you're phase on, you see the highest velocity. Um, so that's nice, and uh, you know you can correct for that. Um, you can build a model for these galaxies, what their intrinsic axis ratios are, and how it relates to inclination. Uh, you can correct them. And then this is now the inclination corrected dynamical mass versus the stellar mass. Okay, so we're not quite there yet. Uh, oh yeah, thank you. So the, the, the orange points are X-ray have, have X-ray sources. Okay, so they're typically weak, but still, because uh, these are extremely deep fields, uh, they're AGN. And the odd thing is, again, the AGN don't really stand out in, this, in these diagrams, which is, which is remarkable. Now these, this one, for instance, I bet it's actually you know, dominated by wind. Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, mostly they just follow the other points by selection. I guess. Yeah, yeah. We, we selected things that, that were, you know, in that compact region, and then we gave preference to things that were around, you know, 10 to 11 and, and sizes of one kiloparsec, just to have a fairly homogeneous sample. Yeah. Um, so th the most, the, the, the most, mostly what happened is that the error bars are increased because it's the error in inclination. Uh, but the actual scatter is only a little bit smaller. So that doesn't help. Now, this part you can explain by, you know, anything you like, dark matter, outflows, AGN, uh, whatever. Uh, measuring too high a velocity dispersion is easy, uh, but this is much harder, right? A dynamical mass that's below the uh, stellar mass is not something uh, that you like. Now, uh, Gary isn't here, but uh, you can say, you know, there's a discrepancy and that we can learn from that, right? We can, um, we can actually derive something from this. I don't think he ever said that, by the way. <laughs> but <laughs> it seems like something he could say. Um, um, and uh, so let's go back to, um, you know, our, our complicated equation that we've been using. The dynamical mass goes as uh, sigma squared uh, times radius. And this part, we've, we've done sort of all we could to that. Right, we've corrected for inclination, so that pumps up the uh, the velocity. Oops, whoop, the velocity is a bunch, um, and uh, there's and we've ignored any contribution from winds or other other things that could increase the velocity dispersion. Now this part, we've assumed so far that the gas effective radius is the same as the as the stars, right? And the stars are very compact, so that's why we got those high dispersions in the first place, predicted dispersion. And for the for the absorption lines that work, but for the emission lines it doesn't. So maybe it's because the gas is more extended. 
And then if there's a, a Keplerian fall off, you know, if the, if, the, if the velocities go down at large radii because most of the mass is in that compact component, that could explain why we're seeing these low velocities. Um, and so you can derive, you can just say that, you can state that, that this is what's going on. Uh, and then if you state that, you can derive the radius of the gas by requiring that the dynamical mass equals the stellar mass. So you can derive the radius of the gas. Uh, which is done here. So this is the inferred radius of the gas, half light radius of the gas. So it's just the radius of the stars now. Uh, and you have this large scatter. So this is just a projection of the previous plot. It's nothing else. It's, it's rewriting it in terms of the radius of the gas. Uh, now that, that's just a game, right? Uh, we've, we've not actually done anything new here except rewrite, uh, re recast this diagram. But there's an interesting aspect here because the inferred gas radii for some galaxies are so large because they have such low velocities, uh, that you should be able to measure it, even from the ground. Uh, because this is an arc second here, central aquatic, that they could see. And so this, is, this is actually follows the, not just the paper, but also the, 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 the actual process that we went through. We went back to the, to the data and looked at the 2D spectra and just to see if there was anything to see. We never expected it because they're so tiny. Um, and, uh, and these are, again, the spectra, and these are now the 2D spectra. So these are the, the 2D spectra that, uh, you know, straight from the data. Um, and so the interesting thing is, of course, um, that, that some of them clearly are resolved, right? Even that one. We got AO data later for that one. It's, it's resolved. And, uh, you know, this one. Something we never expected because they're supposed to be 0.1 arc second, uh, you know, completely unresolved. The, the seeing is typically, you know, 0.6 to 1 arc, 0.6 arc second to 1 arc second. Uh, this is N2. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, N2 and H alpha. So that's sort of a check on whether, you know, yeah. we, we understand what we're seeing. Yeah, so the black is the, uh, the, the spectrum collapsed in the, in the wavelength direction. So that's the, uh, the spatial profile. And then the, the orange for a MOS fire, we had a good point spread function because we had a bright star in the mass. Uh, the NERSPEC data, we didn't have a point spread function, so we couldn't fit those data, unfortunately. This is, no, it's, it's uh, the horizontal axis is, is frequency, wavelength. And this is the spatial position along the slit. Yeah. So this is H alpha and two. Yeah. yeah, so qualitatively, of course, we see rotation too, you know, which is great. But, but the, the actual rotation velocities are going to be greatly diminished because of the seeing, you know, by a huge amount, like a factor of five or ten. So it's hard to actually measure these rotations and, and interpret them. It's possible, but it's, it's really hard. But qualitatively, it shows that they're, they're spatially resolved. You know, there's no doubt about it. Um, and, uh, and so and then you can actually measure the gas size by fitting, you know, an exponential uh, profile to these things and taking the seeing into account. Uh, and you get, you get a radius for the gas out of this for the ones where we have a, a star. Um, and then you can do the obvious thing and compare the measured radius uh, from this to the predicted radius based on, you know, all, all the previous slides. And so this is what you get. Uh, so you only have it for the galaxies that we observed as MOS fire. So the sample is a little small. Uh, but uh, this is the measured gas radius. So this is the inferred one uh, just from the, the width of the H alpha line uh, and the stellar mass. Uh, and so there, there, you know, there's excellent agreement given the large error bars. Uh, we, we were surprised to see anything at all, frankly. You know, that, that, that there's actually a correlation is, is great. Um, yeah. yeah. No, that's right. Yeah, we, we, we observed it just last week with the AO uh, on, on Keck. Uh, because, yeah, I'm very worried about that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. This one is nice and big, you know. But uh, but it's it's hard to say because it, it's so seeing dependent. Uh, but yeah, this 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 one is a is a concern. Yeah, yeah. well spotted. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, only two of them had an um, uh, you know the, the Grism covers oxygen for a bunch of them with lower with smaller wavelengths. So we don't most of them we have nothing just as it happens uh, where, where the oxygen three fell in the Grism and which ones had a decent Grism spectrum. But for two we do and. Um, they're indicated with the, the solid symbols here. So we measured that's from oxygen three from the HST data. Yeah. 
and one of them was in both samples, and I think it was connected with a line. So anyway, so this kind of worked, surprisingly. Um, and, uh, uh, and so you can then, you know, uh, with, with this uh, in, in the bag, sort of, you can take one step further and say, well, all these galaxies are kind of similar, right, in, in their mass and in their size, et cetera. We selected them that way. And um, the in, in, this, in this picture, the gas is really just a tracer particle. Because, you know, as you get further away from the galaxy, uh, you see this fall off of the rotation curve. But essentially, the, all the mass is in this compact components. That's how we derive these uh, inferred uh, radii. And so you can then construct a rotation curve, right, from, from these data. You can plot all these galaxies, the inferred rotation velocity, that's the inclination corrected rota rotation velocity, versus the radius of the gas here. Um, so this is, these are completely independently measured. The, uh, one is the uh, width of H-alpha in the wavelength direction, more or less, and the other is the width of H-alpha in the spatial direction. Um, and that gives you a rotation curve here that's then fallen, right? It peaks at sort of 450 kilometers per second or 500 kilometers per second, uh, but then it drops. And so this is the rotation curve you expect uh, if, the, um, uh, if the stars have all the mass, right? Um, and, so, and this is if, if there's also a lot of mass in, in the gas, which we can exclude, actually. Well, the, the, the ionized gas mass is going to be very low anyway. Uh, but this would most of the mass would be in the molecular gas, which we don't really have a good handle on. Uh, but mass gas fractions of like 30 or 40 percent are still consistent, you know, for me. Apparently not. <laughs> yeah, we don't do dark matter here. Uh, which is actually uh, predicted, too. Uh, there's, there's models by Zolotkov and also Johansson uh, who predicted rotation curves, and they look much like this, actually. Um, so, uh, so good. Um, so it's, it, it's, it, it kind of works. We now finally understand these galaxies, uh, it looks like. And uh, so the, the immediate progenitors then of these, these dead things are complex star forming galaxies. And they're complex. They have these AGN, uh, a lot of them have AGN. They don't seem to do much, these AG AGN, but they are present. Um, lots of dust, and they have these, these falling rotation curves. So not much gas or dark matter within five kiloparsecs. Then, um, so we, 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 we're now a little bit further, right? We can say, okay, one step before here, there's these, these complex star forming things with these ionized gas distributions around them. Um, but then the question is what happens at, at even earlier times? Can I try to, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll get there. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and yeah, uh, th this part is much shorter. So I hope depends on the questions. Um, okay, so anyway, so now we'll go go to here, and indeed, to <laughs> to the question, uh, what what actually you know, can we now say something about these these scenarios? Uh, so we're now moving to to this part here, right, of the of the story, um, and um, uh, now in this size mass plane. So if we just stick stick to that projection here uh, of size versus mass, they actually have quite different traditions for how they, how they move in that plane. You know, from merging, you have two large galaxies that form a, a smaller galaxy, right? So you kind of move into this diagram from above, if you will. The compaction, similar story. You have a large galaxy that, that forms a bunch of stars, but mostly decreases its size. So that's how you get here. Uh, well, incre ma increase of mass, right? So it goes to the right here. Yeah, so the, the arrow goes to the right. So it oh, uh, the, you form stars in the center. Yeah, mass and stars. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. The gas just moves to the center and then turns into stars in, in the, these models. Um, and uh, so anyway, so those models are sort of up there, but the in situ growth would just be something small here, you know, getting bigger like that. Um, and um, I should say that this is the I think the sort of the canonical view now. Uh, you know, uh, you candles, papers, and talks, uh, you know, oops, Sandy, Sandy Faber, uh, you know, Deco, everybody. This is sort of the preferred thing. Also, an illustrious merging is a, is a big thing. Uh, they, you know, th this is, I think, the prevailing idea, that you have all these star-forming galaxies up here, and then sometimes one of them kind of drops down there uh, for, for, for a particular reason. Um, and so we, we try to address this, or to, to try and answer this, by asking the question, how do galaxies actually move in this plane, both in data and in simulation, when they're just forming stars, 
when they're doing their sort of normal thing, right? This, if you take a large galaxy population, wh where, where does it go in, in this diagram? And uh, so I, I'm plotting a bunch of tracks here. This is, this is from you know, a paper that, that, that we did a few years ago. Uh, and this is um, um, a number density matched sample, so a rank order matched sample um, of, of things that today have a mass of the Milky Way. So you're basically ranking galaxies by their mass and then asking, okay, the Milky Way today is this 20th massive galaxy in a particular volume. Now I can go to higher redshifts and I ask what happens to this 20th massive galaxy. And you know, this, this technique has its pros and cons, but it's a way to, to link galaxies across cosmic time observationally. And so uh, this is what you get. So they, they, this is from redshift three to one and a half uh, and when, when all the galaxies are star forming in that sample. So they, they grow in mass by some and then they grow in size by some. Now here's a, a different sample. This is similar technique, also number density match, but for massive galaxies. Okay, much more massive galaxies, massive ellipticals today. And they go from redshift three to about one and a half. They're pretty flat actually. And then they take this sharp turn where they increase a lot in size. This is after they stop forming stars. And this is due to minor mergers, we think. This is how these compact galaxies build up their outer envelopes. And so uh, this is essentially this the massive galaxy evolution. Uh, while they're forming stars, they're over here. This is illustrious. Okay, illustrious galaxies are too big, well known. Um, but um, you know th that's kind of irrelevant for at this point. Uh, the point is the track. So this is the uh, massive galaxies in illustrious uh, the disk. Um, no, no, that's that, that's just uh, actual, yeah, truth. Paul Torrey just wrote a paper on this, and so the answer, the, the quick answer is, if you go forward, it works. If you go backwards, it doesn't. <laughs> if you <laughs> if you take a galaxy at redshift two and you ask what are its descendants at redshift zero, the number density matching works beautifully. If you ask, if you take a galaxy at redshift zero and you ask what was its ancestor at redshift two, it doesn't work. Uh, we can talk about it later. Uh, it's, it's very interesting, actually. Um, but so the question we were asking here was actually wrong because we asked what were the Milky Way progenitors. We should have asked what do those little galaxies redshift two turn into? Oh, they turn into the Milky Way. <laughs> uh, yeah, it sounds crazy, but it's it's true. Um, so this is Hirschman. So Hirschman, the, the, this is uh, uh, a cosmological implementation of the uh, the simulations that Knapp and Ostreicher and others were doing. And uh, this includes the, the Finlater and Dave uh, feedback models. So this is a lot of feedback in these models, in sort of a different, completely different method than the Wellens et al. So they get small galaxies, as you can see, right? Very small. Uh, but uh, don't care about that right now. These are the tracks, right? The direction. Uh, this is Zolotov. So these are these compaction models, actually. Now, uh, this is kind of cheating because these are individual galaxies now, not, not averages. And so Zolotov is actually doing a great job in getting a lot of variation in sizes, which is also observed. Um, but so you can take the average of all these tracks, and that's the, uh, the dashed line here, okay? So those are the decal Zolotov models. Now the point is, as you may uh, start to gather from this, that they're actually all kind of parallel, right? Um, when galaxies are forming stars and just doing their normal thing, either in data or in simulations, um, they, they, when they increase in, si in mass by about a factor of 10, they increase in size by a factor of 2. Uh, now, why that is, is an interesting question of its own. Uh, it has all sorts of interesting uh, implications, but uh, I don't think anybody's actually said that before, uh, not, not in this way at least. And, uh, and it's an important result of its own, uh, that this is how galaxies apparently behave. And it's hard to get away from that. It's also more or less the slope of the mass-size relation today, not, uh, not surprisingly. Right? Yeah, d uh, well, a constant density, w a 3D density within the effective radius. Uh, but these mostly are disks, so it's not entirely obvious that this should be the case. But yeah, no, th th that, that might be part of it. Yeah. Um, anyway, so, so there we go. Uh, this is how galaxies move. So we know now, uh, we have a model for how galaxies move in this plane. Um, and so then you, that means you can build a complete model for galaxy evolution, because you know how galaxies move in this plane. You get the mass growth from the star forming sequence. You know, that's been measured, like how, much, uh, how many stars a galaxy forms at a, at a fixed mass. Uh, then you, that gives you the size growth as well through that relation. And the only thing you, you need to do is some implementation of quenching. That as galaxies reach some threshold in density, they, they tend to quench. And so here, uh, this is a simple velocity dispersion threshold. Uh, this is the probability that a galaxy is quenched. And so if it reaches like 300 kilometers per second, uh, it's dead in this simple subscription. Okay. So that gives us a complete model for, for how galaxies move in this plane as a function of cosmic time. 
they, they move along these green arrows until they reach a velocity dispersion threshold here, um, and then they, they die. Okay. Um, now, uh, so uh, this is this sort of parallel tracks idea, very different from these compaction models, where galaxies just move along, you know, do their own thing, and depending on the initial angular momentum they had, uh, and just, just grow sort of separately. But the, case, the question, of course, is what's the evidence, right? So this is, this is just a, a, a model. Um, and so we tested this actually um, using the, the same 3D HST data set. And so, um, so this is the observed distribution of galaxies in the size mass plane. This is all galaxies now uh, between redshift 2.3 and 3, okay, number density plot. Um, and then you can take this model and evolve this forward in time and ask at lower redshift, does the distribution actually, uh, you know, is it similar to the predicted distribution? Yeah, every time. So this is then later, okay, this is this distribution evolves forward in time, so it moves sort of up a little, you know, along those arrows, and then when they cross this threshold, they kind of stop. So that's why there's not a not a lot of galaxies up here, right? And yeah, I'll get yeah, 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 you can do that too. And and we did. Um, but the important thing is there is actually this population now of massive compact things down here. That just arises naturally from the things down here. If you just move them forward, they, they end up here. There's actually a few already present. Um, and um, uh, and this is then the observed distribution at the same at that same redshift. So here's the predicted, and here's the observed. And so you know it's it's not bad. And so, well, you know, given given what we're trying to do, um, and so this is more quantitative. So this is in two mass bins, you know, uh, below 10 to 11, above 10 to 11. This is the size distribution. And this is the prediction from moving the evolving the galaxy the distribution forward in time. And then these are the uh, observed points. Uh, so, you know, it's pretty close, I would say. And in particular, we get these galaxies at one, you know, uh, KPT, more or less right, at the right number. Um, and so, yeah, I, sorry, I speed up a little bit. You can then include the, uh, the star formation aspects as well. And we do, again, pretty well there, uh, except at, at, at this, you know, very large, very massive bin where we predict uh, uh, that galaxies are dead, but actually some still, still form each time. Nothing. No, it's just, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, that's that's turning into the consensus view that merging is 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 less important than star formation uh, for most masses and most cosmic epochs. At low redshift, at high masses, it's all merging. Uh, but at redshift, you know, two to three, at, at these sort of intermediate masses, uh, I think most people would say star formation dominates. Yeah, well, uh, this is this is slightly lower redshift than what I showed before. It's the same data, and so this is redshift uh, 1.5 to uh, to 2.3, so slightly lower redshift, and you get more dead ones. And there are some star forming ones in here. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what I'm trying to say is that this is redshift 2.2 to 3, most of star forming. And the redshift range I showed before happened to be two to two and a half, which is sort of in the middle between these two. And that was because that was where we did the textbook actually. Yeah. So yeah, here it's m at higher redshifts, it's m they're mostly star forming, and at lower redshifts, uh, they're mostly dead. And so the redshift range that we were looking at before, which is when when these populations peak, when the dead ones peak, uh, the, um, uh, the the numbers are roughly comparable. Yeah. It's it's the same, literally the same. The same um, the, um, so anyway, going back to this, this diagram now, um, the, uh, the, the, the conclusion seems to be that uh, the data are consistent with this most boring model, where you don't need compaction and you don't need a lot of merging. And the, the, these galaxies are consistent with just coming out of you know, this, this bin here. So much lower mass, slightly smaller size. Uh, that seems to be how galaxies uh, behave. And well, <laughs> you know, one, one, one response that I would have, and that which is not the same answer, is that uh, this, this says nothing about individual galaxies. You know, this is the average of the population, which is all we can measure, you know, because we can't trace individual galaxies fundamentally. 
And so uh, individual galaxies may have sort of a, uh, you know, they may have periods where they grow in size very rapidly or they decline in size very rapidly. And on average, this is the, these are the tracks. So, I, you know, and then th there's a lot of wiggle room there, I would say. And uh, Avishai Dekel's response has been uh, that, that he now thinks of compaction no longer as galaxies getting smaller, but as galaxies uh, getting uh, larger by a smaller amount than you'd expect. Which is, you know, uh, yeah, fair enough, you could say. And then, you know, even this, this because the, 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 the arrow here is fairly shallow, you know, it's, it's constant 3D density within the effective radius, which is a fairly shallow slope, 0.3. And so he would call that arrow itself a compaction arrow, I think, today. But, you know, then, then it becomes semantics. No, we're going to get way more. I mean, arrows, we're just beginning with arrows. <laughs> Yeah, I'll get to that in a second. That, that's my last slide. Yeah, thanks. Uh, let, me, let me just show that. So the, uh, this, this, hmm? More arrows. Yeah, there you go. Look. <laughs> you can leave if you want. <laughs> uh, anyway, so this is like the, the cartoon. It's also a cartoon. It's a cartoon with arrows. Uh, so again, size mass. And so the idea is that you have this growth dominated by star formation. You know, galaxies move along that, those tracks. Then they reach the thresholds, and then the growth is dominated by mergers. And, you know, it's a simple picture here. And uh, present-day early-type galaxies live over there. Like, they're all kind of big and all kind of massive. Um, and uh, so this is where these compact uh, Redshift 2 galaxies live. And it's sort of tempting to think that these galaxies are progenitors of slow rotators today, because you have all these mergers going on that, that sort of obliterate the, uh, the rotation. Uh, and then you have the, you know, I would call SINs galaxies that have been studied a lot by, uh, you know, uh, Genzel and, and, and company and, and Kirsten Schreiber and uh, Lydna Tocconi. So um, those are these big fluffy disks, you know, they're sort of already like Milky Way um, philosophies and, and gigantic and at Redshift 2. Uh, they exist, obviously, and uh, so they may, they may just be here, you know, completely divorced from that other track, and they could be fast rotators today. You know, I'm hesitant to say as zeros, but, but something along those lines. Uh, and so in this model, galaxies lead really independent lives. Or they could lead independent lives. These things just never talk to those. They may have different IMFs. They may have different, you know, all sorts of things. Uh, and it may all be dependent on the initial angular momentum distribution, you know, from very early time. And they just set these galaxies off on their different paths. And only today they actually meet up again, you know, and at the high mass ends at least. So that's the thought. Sorry for going on so long, uh, but thanks for listening.